Hi, this is Chaplain Greg, and uh, with The Wandering Wesleyan, if you are enjoying this content, please like and subscribe, share, and, and comment below. So uh, today is uh, a sermon that I gave on Revelation. We're going to talk about the seven seals, the seven bowls, and the seven trumpets. And uh, it, I, I think you're going to find this interesting. If you haven't seen the Bible Project's two videos, and I'll put links in, in the uh, show notes below. If you have not seen those yet, please do. Uh, they are well worth your viewing. Um, but until then, uh, this is Chaplain Greg, and here is a sermon on the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. Good morning. Let me pray real quick. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning, church. It's uh, been a while since I've been up here. And uh, it's good to get off of the injured reserve list and back into the game. <laughs> And uh, we're going to continue our series about the coming of Jesus, uh, the return of the King. And uh, last week, Pastor Brandon, and I got some reverb up here. If we could cut the reverb, that would be awesome. Uh, last week, Pastor Brandon spoke about a, a very dark figure, and that is the Antichrist. And uh, so to, uh, to make things even, he said, well, why don't you just preach on this little subject called, you know, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. <laughs> Thanks, pal. <laughs> um, but it's, it's important. It's really important. Um, the Antichrist is this snaky figure, and if you go to my uh, uh, Sunday school class, you know what I mean by that. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3. This snaky figure that we see all throughout Scripture, and he, he gains this personage in, in the book of Revelation. The Satan, the accuser, the, the persecutor, and he winds his way through scripture, scripture, wreaking havoc and mayhem wherever he goes. In fact, I think of him sort of like mayhem from the Allstate commercials, where, you know, <laughs> just wreaking havoc and, and destruction and just walking away laughing at it, you know. Um, he's dark and he's evil and he spreads darkness and chaos wherever he goes. And today's sermon... Is going to be, it's going to start out equally as dark. Because like most great literature, things have to get really dark before the light comes. Think about the book in which this series is based on, The Return of the King. The battle at Pelennor Field seems unwinnable. The army coming out of Mordor seems undefeatable. And the ring seems indestructible. And the book's darkest moment comes when Frodo has the ability to destroy the ring, and he chooses not to. When the Bible, with the Bible, the same is true. We have to move through these dark and challenging spots in order to get to the light. Now, I'm going to be throwing at you a bunch of scripture references. I'm not going to read them all. Write them down if you can. If you miss them, email me and I'll send you. I got some charts up here that uh, are going to, they'll be self explanatory when they get there. If you don't get it all, email me. I'll get it to you. There's going to be a lot of scripture that I'm going to be uh, throwing out there and it's going to add a little bit more color to what I'm going to be talking about. See, part of the problem is when we approach the book of Revelation, we tend to come from two different extremes. So the first extreme says, I'm going to read this book completely literally, and I'm going to set up all my timelines, and I'm going to have these big charts of this is going to happen, that's going to happen, that's going to happen, that's going to happen. And then you get these knuckleheads that start predicting the date of when Jesus comes, and they're all a bunch of goofs. <laughs> so that's one way to read it. The other, the other way to read it is, oh, this is too complicated. There's so, many, so much weird stuff in Revelation. We got dragons, we got death and destruction, and, and I, you know, we're just not meant to understand it. And with all respect to both sides, I don't think those views are correct. See, John's letter to the seven 
Jesus communities in Galatia and then spreading throughout the Roman Empire. He called it the apocalypse or the revelation. It has to be read first in its given context for us to understand it. Um, one of the guys I talk about a lot in our, in our Sunday school class is Dr. Michael Heiser, and he reminds us the Bible is not written to us, but it's written for us. Amen. Revelation was written to seven Jesus communities in Galatia, and then eventually to the Rome, churches in first century Roman Empire. We have a lot we can learn from that as well. So to understand Revelation, we have to understand two critical things. The first is its genre. We talk about that in our Sunday school class, the genre of the book. Revelation is poetic, prophetic, and apop apocalyptic literature. Now, what do I mean by that? By poetic, I mean there's a rhythm and a connection throughout the book. There's movement. There's structure to it. Not only connections within the book itself, but also to Old Testament passages, especially Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and we're going to look at Zechariah and Exodus as well. Poetry uses few words to say a lot. So think about a Robert Frost poem. In a small poem, such as The Road Less Traveled, he can say an awful lot. And we can have discussions on what he actually meant by it. And none of these discussions are contradictory. They're just trying to understand it. A newspaper article, on the other hand, has a whole bunch of words and usually says very little. <laughs> so that's what I mean by pro poetic. Prophetic, I mean that revolution speaks a message of God to his people to his people in the first century, to his people in the 21st century. This is a prophetic book that talks about things that were to come in the first century, second century, the 21st century, and beyond. By apocalyptic, I mean that John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, remember, the Holy Spirit's behind this whole thing, he uses a particular way of writing that's common in the first century and in the ancient world to deliver a message from God using fantastic imagery, symbolic numbers, and allegory. And that brings us to the dark part of this morning. The seven seals on the scroll, the bowls, and the trumpets. What some people call the Great Tribulation. Now, notice first, it's three set of sevens. Numbers are important in apocalyptic literature. Three is the number of God. Seven represents perfect completion. Through these three sets of seven, we see that God is completing and bringing to an end all things. Before we get into these three sets of seven, I want to offer you a particular way of looking at these contents. So most of the time, we see what's about to happen in these seals and trumpets and bowls as God's wrath and anger spilled out onto the earth. And that is undoubtedly true. But I also want to posit to you that what we are also seeing is human sin unleashed to its fullest potential. In Genesis 3, we learn that the heart of sin is humans saying to God, I know better than you. It's human beings saying, I want to do things my way. It's okay for me to take over this country because I think it's the right thing to do. It's just sex. Take your pick. All of it is demonic. These things that we're about to witness is that human proclivity to tell God we know better come to its full fruition. What we see is violence, injustice, destruction, and chaos. In Revelation, we see the unleashing of human sin combined with the unleashing of the Antichrist 
leading to the unleashing of God's judgment. So let's start with the seals. If we could go to that graphic here. I want you to see that the seals and the trumpets and the bowls are not running concurrently, meaning that these happen, then these happen, then these happen, but they're parallel. Okay? Each tells a story of human sin and how God's judgment with a different perspective and a different view. Each complements each other. The three sets of seven describe what first century Jesus followers were going through then and what has happened since and is what, is, what is happening now in our times and what will ultimately happen in the future. It is a theological concept called the already and the not yet. Okay? So things that are happening today, Ukraine, Israel, Azerbaijan, take your pick. That's the already. Death, chaos, destruction. But there's more coming. That's the not yet. These three sets of seven talks about all of that. The three sets of seven have been seen repeatedly in human history and in, hu in different ways. Daniel had Babylon and Persian and the Persian empires. John had the Roman Empire. The 20th century had World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Cold War, the Vietnam War. In the 21st century, we have the War on Terror. It goes on and on and on. And we have seen tens, if not hundreds of millions of people perish because of this. The cycle of three sevens continues throughout human history, but someday it's going to end. Starting with the seven seals, in chapter 5, John sees a scroll that needs to be opened in the throne room scene that reflects Isaiah's throne room scene in Isaiah 6, and he weeps because he can't find one worthy to open the scroll. But the angel that is there, reveals to him a slaughtered lamb. The lamb is then treated as a king. You see the imagery there. And this king is worthy to take the seven seals off of the scroll. So the first four seals are removed, and if we can go to the next slide, these are very famous, and that we're talking about the four horsemen. So Revelation 6, 1 through 8, talks about these four horsemen, and they're a direct link back to Zechariah 1, 8 through 11, and 6, 1 through 8. These horses represent political, military, and economic injustice, and this injustice is always, always, always followed by death, the result of sin, and is the ultimate decreative action undoing that which God has done. In the fifth seal, we hear the voice of the martyrs cry out. Those that are killed by this injustice and the persecution of these four horses, and they cry out, how long is this going to go on? And I'll tell you, God gives an answer that really doesn't satisfy. He says, in a little while. But imagine you're a first century Christian. Remember, Revelation is written to Christians under heavy persecution. It's a letter that's written to encourage, to exhort, to say you're going to get through this. So, they would hear this and they would say, oh, God hears us. He knows we're here. He hasn't abandoned us. Now, the first five trumpets reflect... Oh, I'm sorry. I went ahead of myself. Uh, these images go back to Zechariah. We talked about that. The scene must have brought comfort to those living in it. And the sixth seal reveals more ecological terror. And the prevailing theme is that this is the end. 
but we got trumpets and bowls to go. Now, remember, these are parallel. The sixth seal and the seventh seal talks about this is the end, but the seventh seal then reveals the seven trumpets. So the first five trumpets reflect the plagues sent to Egypt from Exodus. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through them all, but in the next slide, we're going to see a little chart, or a big chart, on how what happens in each of these trumpets corresponds to a plague in Genesis. Now, why would John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, use this kind of imagery of plagues? Let's remember why these plagues were sent in the first place. Pharaoh is one of these satanic images that we see in Scripture. He's one of the first, besides the snake. He came in direct conflict with God over the release of Israel from slavery, and at every turn, God gave him the opportunity to do the right thing, and at every turn, Pharaoh shakes his fist stubbornly at God and says, no. John tells his audience that humanity will reap the same plagues that Pharaoh received, only worse, because of our stubborn refusal to repent. The sixth trumpet signals the release of the four horsemen, so it goes back to the seals. Death, destruction ensue, but still humanity does not repent. The seventh trumpet sounds, and the end of all things come to pass with Christ's return. But guess what? Now we got bowls. So we're going to look at it from a, yet a different point of view. And there's a lot that happens in between. And I won't get into that, but please read it on your own. Because we're going to move really quickly up to chapter 16. And the next slide, we're going to be talking about the seven bowls. Again, these bowls are spilled out onto earth and are, like the trumpets, closely linked to Exodus. So I have another chart up here. You get charts when... I love my charts. And again, if you can't write all this down, that's cool. Send me an email. I'll, I'll get it to you. So bowls one through five represent judgment for unrepentance, as did the trumpets, one through five. But things are more violent. They're more dark. And with the sixth bowl, great armies gather together for battle. The satanic enemy has convinced humanity that it has to destroy itself in war. And that's not something that is unconceivable, is it? Ever since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, humanity has the ability to destroy itself. And the Antichrist has convinced humanity to come to battle with itself and destroy itself. And that's when the seventh bull is poured out and God shouts, It's done! Babylon, which was the first century representation of Rome, but today could mean Moscow, Beijing, Washington, take your pick, and could represent any major capital in the future. Babylon is then destroyed. And at this point, you're probably saying to yourself, Greg, man, you are bumming me out. <laughs> All of this darkness, warfare, bloodshed, violence, and destruction... Through it all, we see a vital sign of hope. See, if you read the book of Revelation, if you read it literally, or if you ignore the book altogether, you might miss a beautiful gift that God gives us amid all of these dark images. Sprinkled among all of this violent imagery are nine songs. Can you go to that slide? You can see all throughout, 
nine songs. We start off at chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. The throne room. All of these songs pull the reader, pull the listener into the throne room of God. So that through all of this death and destruction and chaos, God is saying, remember who is God. Remember who is on the throne. He's telling the first century persecuted church, probably persecuted by Domitian, probably persecuted by their neighbors because they won't offer offerings to the local town god, so they find it hard to buy and sell. God is reminding them, I am still God. I still have a plan. Don't lose hope. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of the Lord and of his Christ. He will reign forever and ever. And then the 24 elders who were seated before God in their throne fell face down. And I'm reading Revelation 11, verses 15 through 18. Then the 24 elders who were seated before God on their thrones fell face down, worship God, saying, We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, because you have taken your great power and you have begun to reign. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come, for the dead will be judged to give the reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints, to those who fear your name, both great and small. And the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. So God is reminding, and, and remember, this is coming right in the midst of the seven trumpets, in the midst of the darkness and chaos. So imagine you are a follower of Jesus in the first century, persecuted. Imagine hearing that letter read with all the chaos and violence, and you are probably very familiar with that violence and persecution. In the middle of all that hatred and death comes a song that pulls you back into the throne room, a song that reminds you who is in control. You may seem lost and hopeless, but out of the darkness comes a song, pulling you back into the presence of God. Friends, this is where we are today. We read news reports from Israel, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Afghanistan, as Taiwan fears an overwhelming aggressor, and as followers, in Jesus, followers of Jesus in China, North Korea, Iran, Saudi Arabia, India, North Korea, I already said North Korea, and other countries are persecuted and executed for their faith. It's easy to feel hopeless and fearful. However... Dr. Derwin Gray at Transformation Church, just down the street in Indian Land, once said, what you fear is what you worship. 2023 has been a tough year. And looking at 2024, the election, I don't think it's going to get any better. So do we sink our heads into the news channels and our echo chambers building on our fears? If so, then consider what or whom you actually worship. All that will do is bring depression and despair if you're a follower of Jesus as the world turns increasingly angry, violent, unjust, and immoral. Remember, you have access to a song that will bring you back into the throne room, into the presence of God. We do not fear news of war. We do not fear increasing violence. We do not fear unrestrained political anger and rhetoric. We do not fear the changing climate. We do not fear these things because we do not worship these things. We worship the living God who comes and sits on the throne, who profoundly loves his creation. And he profoundly loves his special creation, humans, us, you, me. If you're a Jesus follower, that's your hope. If you're not a Jesus follower, 
you haven't placed your faith, hope, and trust into Jesus, for crying out loud, what are you waiting for? Today is the day to lose that fear and to worship the living creator God. So as we sing this next song, let's enter the throne room. Let's abandon our fears and worship the living God of this universe.